How's it going tonight? Thank you so much for coming on such a beautiful evening. I know that there's a lot going on in the community, but everybody knows about these lantern flies. So we want to learn how we can deal with them. So tonight is a very special event with Dr. Claire Rutledge. And um, before I begin my introduction of the program, I want to make my reminder, silence those cell phones. And also take note of the um, exits there and there. If you want to get right out to your car, you can exit right through the auditorium. The library will be open for just a little bit longer after the program, though. So if you want to grab a book after, that's fine as well. And by the way, I'm Julia Ray. <laughs> I'm the manager of adult programs here at the library. OK, tonight, this presentation urgently addresses the damage of the spotted lanternfly, which is wreaking havoc on our landscape. And we're going to learn what we can do about it. I want to thank our partners, Planet New Canaan, New Canaan Land Trust, and New Canaan Nature Center for um, co-sponsoring tonight's event. And we are recording this, so um, if you registered, you'll get the YouTube link after the fact. Now tonight, our special presenter is Dr. Claire Rutledge, and the Associate Ar Agriculture Scientist at the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station, CAES. She holds a PhD in entomology from the University of Illinois. Her research specialty is wood boring insects, and major areas of expertise are mating behavior and chemical ecology, as well as trophic interactions and predator parasitoid behavior. Wow. We have a great speaker tonight. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm kind of stunned to see how many people are here. And I hope I can give you some information that uh, will help you deal with, with this pest. Um, Tonight, I'm going to be talking about the spotted lanternfly. And I just want to little, give a tiny little plug at the beginning about our institution. The institution that I belong to is the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, which is not part of Extension. We are our own state agency. We've been here since 1875 and work on a range of issues like invasive insects, invasive weeds, um, food safety, soil soils, all sorts of different issues. And we're, we have campuses sort of more center in the state, in New Haven, Windsor. Um, and we are open to everybody in the state to come ask questions. So please feel free to do so. So here we go. Um, Limacora delicatu. It's uh, native to China and India, although the Indian records are a little sketchy and Vietnam, and it's been an invasive species before. It's hopped over from northern China into the Korean Peninsula um, starting in about 20, 2006, and so they had some sort of previews of what we've been going through. Um, and it was found in September 2014 in Pennsylvania, which was the first North American record. I don't think maybe you guys need this slide. You're an audience that, unlike many of the people I talk to in other parts of the state, you guys are at ground zero. The first population that was found in this state was 2020 on the, in Greenwich, right on the borderline with New York, uh, right by the airport, which is a recurring theme with this guy. It moves very well along transportation corridors. But of course, the one on your, that side, uh, is the spotted lanternfly. You know, as an entomologist who specializes in looking at bugs all day long, I look at these look-alikes and think, well, that's nothing like that. But um, they're big and they have flashy colors. So, so um, this lanternfly, if we just talk a little bit, step back and talk about its uh, family a bit, it's a fulgoroid. And that means it is a plant hopper. It's a family of plant hoppers related to aphids, cicadas, stink bugs. They're mostly tropical. Um, we don't really have any native species in the Northeast. However, there is a native species. Um, the little guy with the red guy that looks a lot like a spotted lanternfly is a native species in the Southeast. But a lot of them have these exciting protrusions off of their face. They're sort of like, uh, you know, if you've ever seen the, the little thorn hoppers, they, they have it off their face. And, uh, people used to believe they were luminescent, which, you know, fireflies exist, so it isn't so crazy. Um, my favorite one is the peanut-headed bug up on the corner there. And here's where that first detection was. So it's in southeastern Pennsylvania, and this is um, in late 2014. So you can see it was already pretty um, well distributed. The survey work that was done, and, and uh, 
USDA APHIS and Pennsylvania Ag and Penn State and everybody tried very, very hard to keep it contained. There was a big effort. It didn't work. So this is the current spotted lanternfly distribution. The blue are squares that, um, the blue are, are, are areas, are counties where known populations are established. And then there's also some um, little dots and those little dots are just individual sightings. So where somebody saw a lantern fly and reported it, but there hasn't been a reproducing population found. And um, this past year has been um, all those Midwestern populations have appeared. And again, these are gonna be along transportation ways. The potential distribution of spotted lantern fly in the United States is gonna be limited by temperature by how many growing degrees days they have. And we'll talk about the life cycle more in detail later, but they have a very, they have one generation a year and it's a long generation and they need enough time, enough temperature warmth to get through it. And so the upper range, the northward range will likely be um, decided not by how cold the winter is, but by how long of a warm growing season there is before the first frost. And of course, that means with the way the world is going now, that's going to continue to move northward. But this is the current predicted, and I didn't do this, of course, um, but this is the current predicted um, distribution. So the high, you can see um, sort of down here in Fairfield and up along the Connecticut River Valley and Thames River valley we've got our thames river valley we've got really really good and then the rest of connecticut is is pretty good it's all right um this is from last year we haven't yet compiled this year because this year has a long way to go um but you can see that as of last year we had established populations in three or four out of our eight counties and sightings everywhere but windham we have had sightings from windham now and um established populations also in Hartford. Uh, to date we've had, and, and it's a little obscure, we're a little obscure as an agency, but we've had 4,300 reports of SLF <laughs> so far this year from people. So a lot of them are coming from Lower Fairfield where you guys are really, and, and they look a lot like, like this distribution that we had last year. Um, but we're getting them from other parts of the state as well. So there is actually a quarantine in effect. Um, this is focused on trying to contain it. It's um, not really very well, it, there's no real way to enforce it, but it is, I think, a way, a, a guideline. Um, and we're gonna talk about why some of these things might be on here, like the outdoor industrial materials and equipment, or shipping and storage contain containers and RVs, and you know, how are those going to impact um, spotted lanternfly? They can't eat those things. Why are they spreading on them? So let's talk about the life cycle. As I said, they have one generation a year. And so the first uh, three instars, and I borrowed this uh, graphic from Pennsylvania. So for us, uh, the first instars are really hatching, the first little baby stage are really hatching in uh, late May, June. So they're starting a little bit later. Um, you go through three different instars that are all little black and white guys. And the first instar kind of looks like our other friend, the deer tick. It's their, that, that size range, and then they get bigger and bigger. And when they reach the fourth instar, then um, they get that exciting red and black and white color scheme going on. And then the adults are starting to be now. Okay. Um, but then... What's really interesting is that they have to mature for a long time before they start egg laying. So even though they're, they're the adults now, they are feeding voraciously for about a month before they even begin to start mating. And I put this other picture on here of this poor uh, female who has lost her wings somehow or another. But you see how her abdomen is just like really big and yellow with black stripes? So those black stripes are the cuticle. And now if you, I put some dead individuals over here, but now if you looked at a female, you would see her abdomen would look black. So that yellow is the, the skin, the integument between the, the plates of its exoskeleton. And so it's sort of like when you have stretchy pants on Thanksgiving. 
<laughs> just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And they need all that because they're going to be laying these large egg masses with um, 30 to 60 eggs, and they could lay one or two. And not only are they laying the eggs, they're also laying this proteinaceous cover over the top of it. And that cover is part of why they are so tricky, because it essentially looks like mud. <laughs> it is very, very inconspicuous. So as I said, they're laid in late September through until the first hard freeze. So last year, that was in the second week of November that we got a 28 degree night and it killed them all. Um, depending on when that freeze is, it's gonna limit their time they can have to lay eggs. But they really aren't starting till the end of September to start laying those eggs. And um, in this picture, this is a picture I took in, in Fairfield, um, Southport, and you can see um, there's one egg mass really hard for me to see this. One egg mass that's covered um, with that uh, proteinaceous material, and it's pretty new. Um, and then it's partially on top of an old egg mass from the year before. So over the, the winter, the proteinaceous material will gradually wear away. And um, when they hatch, that little black line, black hole in the middle that's they've popped the lid off the operculum off and they've come out um, and they they kind of like laying in places where they've laid before so um, we had been doing a, an egg phenology study we we're going out every week and looking and seeing which egg masses were laid that week how many were being when they were being laid and we had circled the old one to make sure we knew that it was there. And then this female came along and she laid her egg on top of the markers. And I, I don't think it was the marker she was excited about. So um, they are phloem feeders. Um, so phloem is the uh, vascular tissue in the plant that, that transports sap. So the, the carbohydrates um, that are in sugars that are created by photosynthesis are, are brought down to the roots for storage. And in the spring, um, if it's a perennial plant, they could be, they'll be brought up. And that's, that's what we're getting when we get maple syrup, is that sugar water. And um, because of that, um, sugar water, as you all know, is not very nutritious. It's not terribly good for you. And you need other nutrients besides sugar. And these guys do too. So they have a specialized digestive tract which allows them to process lots of sugar water and eliminate the vast majority of it so that they can get enough of the other uh, nutrients that they need out of this phloem. Uh, which means that that sugar water has to go somewhere. And where it goes is out the back end where we call it honeydew. <laughs> so. Uh, I've been in the grove in the morning with the morning light shining through and you see the gentle rain coming down from the Atlantis. Um, <laughs> it's lovely. Um, so these are all actually kind of the adult hosts. Um, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, but they, when they're little, they tend to eat more herbaceous stuff like roses, cucumbers all sorts of different things. They have a lot of different hosts. They don't really care much when they're little. Um, and then when they, as they get older, they move on to more woody things. And they actually feed on, through the bark. And they don't really have piercing, sucking mouth parts in a way that's a bit of a misnomer for these guys because they're dependent on the water pressure coming from the plant. So they're not actually sucking. They're just letting the plant push the food up their face. And that's, that's how they do it. So they like plants that are vigorous, that have lots of turgor pressure. But as you can see, there is a wide range of things they like. Uh, Tria heaven, or uh, Alanthus altissima, um, is their favorite. And they like grapes a lot, too. But um, I'm sure most of you know Tria heaven. It is an invasive plant. It has been here for many years. For any of you who read A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, that's the tree <laughs> that was growing in Brooklyn. Um, and, and it, it can be a lovely tree, um, but <clears throat> it is also extremely invasive. And I found, I was just walking around the library, and this is a very lovely kind of tailored part of town, manicured, but I found three, tree of heaven, three trees of heaven um, right over next to this gas station here. 
with the with the construction that's happening. So anywhere you have disturbed soil, they pop in, and you just see them all the time everywhere along the highways. I'm sure you've all seen them. Um, and they they're they have clonal growth, they have abundant seeds, um, and they're not staghorn sumac. But now um, tree of heaven. Um, besides being incredibly invasive and stinky, um, is also, uh, they have a set of defensive compounds that are also allelopathic, which means they kill other plants, um, called the quasinoids, which um, the tree have an, or the spotted lanternfly actually exploits. They will sequester that poisonous chemical in their bodies, and they start to feed on the tree of heaven um, right before they become adults, that last instar. So as they're feeding on the poisonous plant, they're bright red, and that says, hey, watch out for me, I'm poisonous. And um, very few things like to eat them because they taste very bitter. But grapes are also a preferred host for the adult stage, and this is one of the most um, important agronomic impacts we're gonna have of this pest probably is the grapes, and that certainly was the case in Korea. And while there has been uh, impact on stone fruits, like uh, peaches and cherries, and the, the major true uh, impact has been on vineyards. And um, there are a lot of vineyards in Connecticut. I don't know if any of you have done the Connecticut Wine Trail, but there are wineries all over the place, and I've been working with ash trees and spending time in swamps for the last 15 years, and now I have to go to wineries. Ugh. <laughs> They're very lovely, um, and it's a growing industry, but, but the mass feeding, they feed a lot of them, and it's that voracious mm, late summer feeding, early fall feeding to, to create their egg mass, which, which is what does things in, is that just so many of them, and they do tend to feed together in groups, hence the wine stoppers. Uh, so that is, is what we're concerned about the most economically. And not only are they gonna have issues with them in the, grape, in the vines, the other thing is that vineyards in Connecticut are, part of their appeal is the agritourism. You go to the vineyard, you sit outside, you sip your wine, you look at the lovely vineyard and the landscape and have 16 million lanternflies hopping on you. Um, not so nice. So that's, that's also an issue of concern. As I said, the seasonal movement of the spotted lanternfly, and this is actually um, important in terms of thinking about where they are in the landscape and what you need to do about them. Um, when they're little, they're not feeding on trees, they're feeding on tender herbaceous stems. So they really like rose, for example. Rose is great. And it could be cultivated rose or it could be the multiflora rose, which is everywhere. Uh, perennials, um, they like grape at all times of year, tree of heaven at all times of year. They're really into black walnut, river birch, willow, all sorts of different things. But early on in the year, in their seasons, they're gonna be on the smaller stuff, and then now, at this point, they're beginning to move on to the tree of heaven. And one of the things that is a real sort of hole in our knowledge, and we have a lot of knowledge, given that this thing has only been here less than 10 years, um, is, is how far they move and when they move. And, you know, if you get them one year in your, in your garden, it's no guarantee they're gonna show up the next year. Um, it could be sporadic. Um, we don't know how far they go, so if we know that there's a population, oh, for example, in the transfer station, you know, is it going to hop over to somewhere else? So, so that's one of the things we're, we're trying to get a handle on and, and studying this next year. But um, it does make them much harder to predict. As I said, the adult feeding, you could get some, you could get kill the grapes. They do kill tree of heaven after a few years, so maybe there'll be a biocontrol for that. Um, but it could also limit energy going to storage for winter. So for trees, you might get an increased susceptibility to winter injury, um, and it could lead to tree decline. You could get some secondary pathogens. So monitoring, um, currently survey is visual. There's no lures currently available. Um, research is being done as we speak. Um, to try to figure out what the chemistry is that they, they are interested in. Um, and, and people have used sticky bands, just put it around the tree and, and stick them on, but you have to change them out quite a bit. Um, and 
surveys, if you're looking in a new area, definitely look on Tria Heaven later in the year. But um, and egg masses are a very good thing to look for as well, even though they're they're hard to see. So here's a couple pictures of different kinds of traps. Um, there's step-by-step -step guides at the Penn State Extension uh, web pages. Um, and one thing, you know, you have a sticky band on the one side here. You can see some traps on it, but it's really important to put a wildlife barrier so you don't have birds sticking to it and whatnot. Um, and then circle traps are a different way uh, where you sort of funnel them up the tree and into a, a bag so that you're catching large numbers of them. Um, another kind of trap are has recently been developed um, actually by a colleague of mine from grad school. I'm a little reflected pride. Um, egg traps. And when I first saw the title of, it, of his talk last year at the meeting when he said trapping spotted lanternfly eggs, I was like, how do you do that? They don't move <laughs> on their own. You can't lure the eggs in. But, but really what we're doing is exploiting um, their overposition behavior and what they find. Um, on the right is, is a collage of weird places spot and lantern flies lay eggs, just, just all over the place. But they do tend to prefer um, sort of under places, in little hidey holes, smooth surfaces sometimes. Um, they like, like the underarms of trees, whatever you call that area, so underneath the branches um, and, and out of sight. So, one thing that you could do is maybe try to provide an alternative place for them to lay eggs. And, but this is called the lampshade trap, and it's entirely created out of um, peel and stick roofing material. I went and bought a box at the Home Depot, and it's just shingles. And so you put one layer around the tree and staple it down around the tree. And then the other has this side in and goes around like a lampshade, and you staple it around the top, but you also want to put some batting of some sort, cotton batting or along the top so that they don't go out the other end. And this dramatically increased um, the number of eggs that were found in that spot. Um, you know, they were getting 38, 40 egg masses right there. So that's, you know, I think a, a great way of monitoring in an economic situation or just, you know, get a whole lot of egg masses laid in there and then squish them, <laughs> you know. So, so uh, I don't know how much overall population uh, reduction we could would create, but it certainly would lessen the number of nymphs that are starting out in your yard that year. So I think that's it's a really simple, I think, and straightforward and low cost way to trap them, and I think that's pretty exciting. There has been, um, you know, so oftentimes when we get an invasive pest, one of the potential answers is what's called biological control. And I'm sure most of you have heard of the concept of biocontrol, but essentially it's using one organism to fight another. So uh, for example, with emerald ash borer, which I've worked with the biocontrol for a long time, um, there wasn't any specific natural enemy that was attacking it. There is woodpeckers, but woodpeckers are going to stop paying attention once the population drops. But a specific natural enemy will keep that population down. Um, so we were hoping to find something like that in China. And this, this little guy is an egg parasitoid. So it would have been attacking those egg masses and laying its own egg inside there. And their offspring, the little larvae, would eat the spotted lanternfly which is great, we like that, but part of deciding whether or not to release something into the environment, you have to under see whether or not it's safe, whether it's going to impact anything we love or anything else for that matter. You want it to be highly host specific. And as it turns out, this guy isn't. I like um, luna moths <laughs> and other Saturnian moths, so that's, that's a big old no. We're not, we're not doing that. So um, Hunt is still on. There is a nymphal parasitoid, but it's, it's being very difficult to work with, but we'll, we'll see. Um, people are still looking to try to find something. So that is a potential very long-term solution, but right now we're still sort of in the early stages of trying to figure it out. So for a summary, you know, when what, what they're finding in Pennsylvania is that in a residential landscape, it's primarily a nuisance pest. 
Um, you might have a huge concentration of them one day. They might go flying off the next. They are an additional stressor to your plants, but for most plants, they will not directly kill it. There's lots of things that could also stress your plants. Um, so you want to scout for them before you decide you need to spray for them. That's always important. Um, and not every year, tree on every property needs to be treated every year. You know, wait till you see whether or not you have the problem that year. And I know you guys are like right in the brunt of it right now, so that seems like a little silly. But remember last year there weren't that many. So it, it just, it's going to be variable from year to year. Um, what shows up in your specific yard. I think there is a lot of information, I know there is a lot of information out there in terms of pesticides that you could use. We have information on the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment website. If you just go there, there'll be spotted lanternfly pesticide recommendations. I think um, unless you're a commercial grower, try not to freak out, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's, 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 there are things you can do for treatment, but, but um, they're not likely to kill everything. They might add additional stress, but they're not going to kill things. Um, it's not as serious as something like beech leaf disease. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We have a couple more flyers on the table here, um, and thank you for coming to the library.